Welcome to my podcast called Discover Your Power, where you will learn how to release limiting beliefs, create abundance and manifest the life you deserve and that truly works for you. My name is Yanya Eibi, transformational healer, author and coach. There is so much more joy, health, wealth and success available to you when you get a true perspective on how life really works. I want you to have what you deeply desire. And these podcasts will help you find your truth, unlock your potential and empower your life. There have been a lot of changes in the past year, both globally and individually, for all of us. And it's not over yet. But change is not necessarily bad. I've heard from some people that their lives, occupations or businesses have flourished, while for a majority, the changes have been really challenging. How we perceive change has a lot to do with how we experience that change. When our default is that any change to what presently is is going to be bad, then of course we resist it, try to change it back, <laughs> usually unsuccessfully, and the whole endeavor becomes painful mentally and emotionally. But if our default thinking is, how is this change going to serve me? Let me see where the benefit of this is. How is it going to make my life easier? Then your mind is occupied with positive expectation, and the smallest benefit you can find, when you dwell on it, will trigger other thoughts of possible benefits. You have now changed your frequency, and when a frequency changes, whether it's a planetary frequency, or our own personal frequency, it must, of necessity, have an effect on everything that it touches. And the frequencies that the Earth is being showered with since the year 2012, when we left the Piscean Age and moved into the Age of Aquarius, are very different from the frequencies that were being broadcast over the last 2,000 years. So what happens when we're touched by an energy that has a different frequency? Something always changes, but it's subtle, so we may not be immediately aware of it. Only in hindsight do we see how we react differently to what's happening around us. You know that many things in the world are now undergoing massive changes. And if you look back over your own life, quite possibly you will notice things that are now really different from what they were a few years back, and notice changes in the way how you react to events and circumstances. In my own life, I notice that things which used to upset me no end, mostly to do with technology, when it doesn't work like I think it should, <laughs> and where I used to react with self-abuse, I'm stupid, incapable, not good enough, and then I would be upset for hours, if not the whole day. Now, there is just a flash of frustration. Why won't it do what it's supposed to? I try again, and if it still doesn't work, I forget about it and go on to something else with the thought, I'll see if it works tomorrow. Technology has its moods. That's a shift from blaming yourself to acknowledging that things don't always work out as I would like them to, and that's okay. Life is so much more peaceful now, because, as you must also know, Computers and technology have a mind of their own, and things work again an hour or two or a day later. Which tells us that a change has occurred 
in our consciousness and memory. Without memory, we could not even be aware of changes. Everything would always be new and unprecedented, but we would not see it as different, since we would not have any memory of the past. To illustrate this, let's imagine someone who not only has lost their memory, but that the parts of their brain responsible for memory have been damaged in some way, so they no longer keep any record of what's going on. If you just have amnesia, you can't remember your past, so in that first moment, you're a blank slate. But then, the things you see and do create a trail of memory so you again can relate to changes from the time you woke up in the present moment. But now imagine you have woken up from the trauma that has destroyed the parts of the brain responsible for conscious memory. Everything you encounter would be new in every moment. You eat an apple, the taste is what it is. You don't remember ever having eaten an apple before, so you don't know whether it's a good apple or a sour one. The next day you eat an apple again, it is what it is. You don't remember ever eating an apple before. Or you are faced with a panther. You don't remember that panthers are dangerous. You look at it as it is, shiny, graceful, with a long tail, and it looks at you. If it snarls at you, in that moment you feel fear. But tomorrow, when faced with it again, you won't remember your fear. You will look at it as a new experience, and the panther may remember you are not a threat, maybe won't snarl, and you will feel safe. In essence, when you don't have memory, you have no past and therefore no future. You are living in the eternal now, and you don't have any judgment. A baby who has never seen the flame of a candle will reach out to touch it, but if it succeeds and is burned, it will never do that again. It's our memory that tells us whether we like or don't like what's happening. We relate the present event to what has happened in the past and often react as we did in the past because we don't realize we have grown and changed since that past event. Situations have changed, people have changed, circumstances have changed. And so our reaction to this present situation, based on a previous event, may no longer be appropriate. I'm just thinking of an example of that I saw. You may have seen those false candles that work off a battery. They look like a real candle, but the flame is a thin blade mirroring a light and is actually flickering. It looks very real. I know of a person who went up to it to blow it out. She blew and blew and it flickered even more, but didn't go out. Finally, someone told her it was a false candle and she had to laugh at herself. You see, her reaction was one coming from her past conditioning that one had to blow on a lighted candle to make it go out. Now, with battery-operated candles, that response is no longer appropriate. Memory is a necessary and vital part of our makeup. Without it, we would be in constant danger of one sort or another. But we have to use our discernment to know when our memory is serving us and when it's not telling us the truth about this present moment, however true it may have been in the past. Without change, we would quickly get bored, so we look forward to change. We even create change for ourselves. We don't eat the same meal every day. When our job is repetitive, doing the same thing over and over, 
we wish for variety. And when it doesn't come, sometimes we even resign from the job. Inherent in our makeup is striving for more, for something better, for discovering that perfect existence that we know exists, but which is so hard to find. We welcome and accept change when we think it's an improvement on what was, but resist it when we don't like it. This is where we so much diverge from spirit's state of being. We judge events or situations as good or bad. Hardly ever do we stay in the neutral position of this just is. Judging something as good is just as much of a judgment as making it bad. Because everything we see is only a relative perception of the ultimate perfect spiritual reality, which is all goodness, all light. Anything less than the ultimate spiritual perfection are just steps going down into greater and greater darkness, more and more negativity. Every human being is, at their core, that light, hidden under layers of less than good choices they've made at various times. Just as when the sun is obscured by a cloud, and sunlight doesn't reach a portion of the earth, that area is darkened, but the sun is still shining. It's still there, and as soon as the cloud moves away, sunlight comes back automatically. The less than good choices we make in our life are those clouds, and the good news is we have the possibility in every moment to make a better choice that dissolves the cloud. It takes awareness, then a decision to do or not do certain things, then a commitment to hold to that decision, and consistency in our attempts to always make a higher choice than before. And finally, getting a support structure that will keep us on track because if we could do it on our own, we would have already, right? Judgment and all its negative consequences are human qualities. They result in resentment, frustration, shame, or guilt. They don't exist in nature or in animals. Domestic animals who have lived with people for centuries are often a reflection of our thoughts and even our experiences. Sometimes they even take on our aches and pains or diseases. So wild animals are a better example of natural laws. When a zebra is brought down by a lioness for food, the herd doesn't get angry, doesn't resent the predator, doesn't declare war on all the lions in the vicinity, and take revenge. They could stampede that lioness to death if they wanted to. They are a hundred or more against one. But once the immediate danger that quickens a fight-or-flight reaction is over, an animal shakes the fear off and forgets all about it, doesn't project it into the future and live the rest of its life in fear of lions isn't resentful and doesn't go to war or attack any stray sleeping lion. In nature, everything serves a purpose and is in service to other parts of life. Grass serves to feed zebras or to make birds' nests soft for the eggs or to fill mattresses so people can sleep comfortably. Some zebras serve as food for lions. Others provide food for birds who peck on the ticks and vermin on their hides. Lions provide fertilizer for grass to grow and leave the skin and bones of their prey for vultures and hyenas. Things happen so that the whole ecosystem can not only survive, but thrive. In nature, there is cooperation between species 
and also between plants and animals, even insects. There's a tree in the African savanna that releases bubbles of sap to attract ants, which then feed on the woodworm that destroys the tree. Cooperation, not competition to get the biggest piece of the pie, is the natural law, because there is no limited pie in nature. Everything is abundant, at least until man interferes with natural laws. Every tree has thousands of leaves, not just enough to get by, but so many that the branches are hardly visible. Look at the grains of sand on a beach or at the stars in the sky. It's only us humans that seem to always be lacking or limited in some way. But it's our thoughts and beliefs that are limiting us, not our soul, not spirit. Our soul is not limited and is every quality of God, just waiting to be expressed into visibility and manifestation. And it must be done through someone or something, a tree, a dolphin, you or me. We are all vehicles for expressing what spirit is in our own unique way. When you were not yet, you, the human, you were that soul and had a purpose in mind for incarnating, some quality or qualities you wanted to bring into the world. You wanted to experience this world. So you embodied, became the life force of a body. Since there is no other way for spirit to experience or materially express itself. But when a soul incarnates, the human part forgets the spiritual purpose, and so we grow up as human beings, learning the ways of the world. And that's all very necessary to not only survive, but thrive. Then, at some point, we start desiring something more. We start realizing there must be more to life than just eating and sleeping as a baby does, then running around and playing as a child, then as an adult, working and sometimes getting a holiday. So we embark on a search to discover that something that's missing, to discover our true spiritual purpose with a little or a lot of focus and determination. We do that either because painful experiences have made us turn away from a world full of problems towards spirituality, or because a person has achieved everything they have ever dreamed or desired, fame and fortune, success and wonderful relationships, only to realize that in spite of it all, it's never enough, that there is still something missing which could not be reached through wealth and material possessions. The soul is always working for our highest good, which is not necessarily material good, although it can be. But it's working towards our conscious union with itself. It's always giving us valuable pointers to help us discover we are already one with it, even if humanly, we still don't know it. It shows us all the things that have worked well without us having to struggle and strive. Those coincidences, those synchronicities, what's called lucky breaks. And in the same way, your purpose in this world is given in a variety of ways. And often, it's our particular talents and abilities or what we really love to do, that shows us the road to take. Even if our parents, teachers or peers say things like, there's no money in being an artist, how will you live? You need to learn business skills, marketing or computer skills instead. All the best paid jobs are in technology. But if that's not your soul's desire, 
those things will never work for you. What will work every time and make your life a happy and fulfilled one is what your soul's purpose was in choosing you as its vehicle of expression. And your life up to now has been a step-by-step preparation for you to deliver your unique perspective, bring your unique contribution to the world. And sometimes your soul's purpose may lie in what you, in this lifetime, never thought of doing or even had resistance to. Such a purpose is much more difficult to detect because the reasons for the dislike or aversion may be hidden in a past life that you are simply not aware of. Even if a medium or a seer tells you about it, you're perhaps not ready to receive the information, so the process may take some time. Anyway, that's what I always tell myself when I begin wondering why it took me so long to discover my soul's purpose. I had to have certain tragic life experiences without which I would not be where I am now. So everything serves a purpose, both the so-called good and the bad, which are just the judgments the human personality puts on events and circumstances. But if we acknowledge every circumstance, without exception, as an opportunity for us to grow in some way, to have a different perception, to have a higher response than in the past, our life can become the one of our dreams. Not necessarily one that materially looks like we envisioned it, but one that will give us the most happiness, fulfillment, peace, joy, and abundance on all levels, which includes, but is not limited to, money. What more than that could anyone wish for? I believe that's the deepest wish of every being, to be in joy, peace, and harmony, happiness, and fulfillment. And since life is progressive, it's never static, it's always moving forward and changing to a greater and greater expression of itself, we also need to move with it to accept changes into a greater and greater expression of ourselves as a representative of divinity in form, radiating into the world the positive qualities that are required in the situation we are seeing or experiencing. Being okay with things as they are, while at the same time, sometimes holding the thought, wouldn't it be nice if the traffic moved a little faster? Wouldn't it be nice if I could just stop thinking things should be different? Wouldn't it be great to live in my new house right now? Just releasing all attachment to the outcome, because you're okay with what's in your life now. I trust this has been valuable and helpful. Do you want to know more? Then check out my website, www.yanyaab.com, where you can find much free material.
Don't miss any of these episodes by subscribing to this channel. And thank you for your willingness to explore more of the abundance life has to offer you. I love you and will speak to you again soon.